I didn't even have to say anything that time. <laughs> That's ridiculous. You guys having a good time? Yeah. Yes, you are. It's been so rewarding meeting so many of you and listening to some of the stories about how you game together as families. I had the opportunity to meet to so many amazing people through this whole thing. And um, we met one family of uh, this man, his three sons, and all four are blind. And they talk about how they play video games together all the time. And now it's a connecting thing for them. And it just, you know, it's amazing to see just the outpouring of people who were not only that work to create video games professionally, um, independently, and people who love them all come together for this. So you guys are making the point that this is something that touches culture in the most broad sense. And so I thank you guys for coming out and, you know, showing the world just how important this is. So I applaud you. All right, you are in for a real treat. So I'm going to read this very professional sounding uh, uh, introduction here. So Robin joined that game company in 2009 in, and is the producer extraordinaire. A designer and computer scientist by training, Robin is a passionate advocate for bringing positive new gaming experiences to the public. Her prior work includes family-friendly franchises like My Sims and Steven Spielberg's Boom Blocks for Nintendo Wii. Robin is an active organizer for the IGDA, LA's annual IndieCade Festival, and the Experimental Gameplay Workshop at GDC. In her spare time, she speaks publicly on game design and production and is finishing a PhD in artificial intelligence at Northwestern University. She believes that by uniting academic, student, and professional game development communities, we can design and produce fresh, broadly accessible ideas, create sustainable work practices, and increase our industry's overall diversity. And her first game love was Mule, for those of you that know what that is. Um, so that is her profession, but I would just want to tell you how I met Robin and what I remember when I met Robin. So I met her through actually a very good friend of mine who is also... Uh, you know, a very active and longtime member of the game community, Mark Delora, who's sitting up front here. And uh, yes, Mark. And uh, we were at E3, and we, Mark and I were walking around. He's introduced, we were just saying hi to a bunch of people, and I'd never met Robin. And here comes Robin. She comes bounding up in this, uh, in this dress, and she had on this really cool handbag, and then she has on black chuck high tops. So here she is in this very nice dress out for this game with this thing with these black high tops. She's like, hey, I'm Robin. How are you? I'm like, oh, I'm Chris. I know exactly who you are. You have no idea who I am, which is fine because you make games and I don't. And uh, she is absolutely brilliant to speak, uh, to listen to speak. Um, she, what she talks about really comes from a place of not only knowledge, uh, but with passion and heart. And so with that, I'd love to welcome to the stage Robin Hunicky. Hey everybody, it's so nice to see you. Thank you for coming out. So yes, as Chris mentioned, we go way back and uh, it's an amazing community. It's an amazing feeling to be here and I just wanted to let you know that I'm here to talk to you today about design. However, I really wanna take a moment and thank everybody who's made this thing possible. Uh, the Smithsonian for hosting us, the dedicated organizers, the sponsors, and most importantly, the amazing creators who made all the games that are upstairs, which are the things that inspired all of us to be here in the first place. Um, for me, and I'm sure many of you, this exhibit is a dream come true. And I just want to take a moment and say thank you. <laughs> Having the chance to participate in something so historic about our medium can feel a little bit unreal maybe, a little bit like it's not deliberate or by design, but that it's more the result of some happenstance, some crazy set of unexpected, crazy but happy accidents. But because I'm a game designer, I know that nothing happens by accident. It is the systems and the practices that we put into place around us that create the things around us. And while many of us here and many of the people upstairs exhibited may not have started out thinking about becoming game designers or game developers, that outcome has emerged from 
the organic and direct actions they take as creatives in their everyday lives. I myself have always been incredibly curious. I love scientific systems. I love to think about how things work. I question not only why things are the way they are, but how they got to be that way. And it's something that I'm very passionate about. I find this to be true of almost every single game developer I meet, this curious scientific questioning. What is it? Why did it happen? However, my interest in the science of things and how they are done is balanced by a desire to understand and improve the way they feel. I am sensitive. <laughs> I'm sensitive to subtle variations in color, to sounds, to the shapes of everyday objects. I will rearrange my furniture just to see if it makes the room feel different. And I will change my clothes to show you how I feel. I am also incredibly fascinated by how all of these things work together to create unique experiences in each of us, how a room will look beautiful to one person and hideous to someone else. Designers who inspire me, who truly move me, also share this deep sensitivity. As a kid, I dreamed of being a sailor. I dreamed of being a painter, a fashion designer, a field photographer, even a poet. And as I grew up, instead of choosing one thing, I just kept adding stuff. <laughs> I kept studying new subjects. I kept adding and piling on passions, uh, gender studies, video production, independent comics, rap music, video games. It starts to sound really like a downward trajectory, right? Like, what happened? <laughs> Poet to video games? But in fact, it's quite to the contrary. My interest in gaming, my interest in technology and in electronic music and things that were produced with these amazing machines led me to computer science and artificial intelligence. They led me from an undergraduate career in studying how people tell stories to a gradu graduate career understanding how we can tell stories with machines. I did not know what these machines had in store for me, that they would lead to a medium that combines all of my interests and all of my passions into something much greater than the sum of its parts. So, what is game design? How do you do it? I don't think any of you would be surprised to hear that there are many more answers than there are game designers in this world. <laughs> so, rather than give you an academic, generalist talk about game design, I wanted to take you on a brief tour of some of the games that I've brought to life. I will outline some core design principles from those projects and then talk about practices that I adopted in my own life because of them. Practices that have made it into the permanent collection I call my design toolbox. And the first goal that we're gonna to cover today, which is something I think is very important, is exploratory play for games based on simulation. I started working at the Sims division after taking a sabbatical from graduate school in 2005. I was 32 years old and I had never worked on a commercial game. Should I repeat that? I had no experience and they hired me to work on my favorite game. <laughs> if you're sitting in the audience right now and you're thinking, I'd love to make video games, I'd love to make a difference in this community, but I'm too inexperienced, I'm too old, please think again. From a design perspective, what makes The Sims successful is that it is whimsically and wildly dynamic. The world simulates little people in an ever-changing environment, and events happen as you play with the system. Your character does these crazy, silly things, and it encourages you to try, to try, to explore, to dig around in that space. What happens if I push this button? What, ha what happens if I push my character in this direction? How mean can I be? How silly can I be? Simulation on this level requires creativity in design because you need to encourage storytelling from a wide variety of players. And this is something that The Sims touched on that nothing else had really reached before its time. 
It also means that the designers have to build tools that support many different kinds of players. For example, your visions of how the Sims would run a business might look something like this or it might be a little bit more like this. <laughs> I'd just like to direct your attention to the top corner of the screen where the executives are sitting on their desks and playing golf. <laughs> Our goal as designers on this project, and I was just a little baby designer on this expansion pack, they were so gracious to hire me, was to make both of these visions and millions more possible with tools that were clear. And to create a game experience that's as dynamic as The Sims, that has as much going on, there are so many systems under the hood, calculating, churning, digging out numbers, making that water fountain go, running that guy through the sprinkler, making the dog bark, making the car move. All that stuff is happening thanks to the glory of computation. And I mean everything, time of day, weather, the moods and actions of the different Sims, you name it. So in order to make changes to a system like that, to add something, to modify the behavior of a system, to remove behavior from the game because it's not really working correctly, it's super complex. It's a huge interdisciplinary job. And that meant that the most important practice that came from an exploratory design goal for, work, for working on this game was strong, creative collaboration. If you wanted to make a decision about this game, it was going to touch something else. Guaranteed, it was going to be tied to something else. And that meant that every day we had to work with character artists, object animators, sound people, engineers, writers, producers. It was endless. In a typical day, we talked, and then we talked, and then we talk some more. And in the overlap of our ideas, there would become a solution. And that was how it worked. We constantly tried to communicate with each other. It was probably 90% of what we did. Design is really hard work. And we didn't always agree on the solutions. If something was going to take too long to build or was going to be too complicated and introduce too many changes, we would have to start over. Or we would have to kind of jiggle the pieces around until they just fit right. And so that collaboration, that ability to communicate with one another was something that I picked up very early on. And it stayed in my toolbox this whole time. The next thing that I worked on was also a Sims game. But it was taking a little bit of the simulation away and adding a little bit more expression because it was focused on giving players tools to express themselves who were quite young. So My Sims was uh, the very, I think it was the second game that EA actually produced for the Nintendo Wii, which at the time was called The Revolution. I was so excited to be working on The Revolution. <laughs> Everybody's like, is this going to work? Is Nintendo totally crazy? What is going on? And you know, I would get to like, tell my friends, like, I'm working on The Revolution. And then it became The Wii, and they all made fun of me. <laughs> But then, it was really popular. We did several prototypes for My Sims, and we couldn't really figure out what we wanted to do with this crazy Wiimote thing, this pointer that you could use to touch the world. But in the end, what we decided we would do is we would create this uh, touchable, tactile gameplay dollhouse experience where people could arrange homes and businesses in a little town by building them up and placing them to attract new town citizens. They could go inside the homes and decorate them. They could build furniture and give it away to different citizens. And they could even go around and explore the world, shaking trees and poking at things, digging things up to find goodies which they could use to customize their world. It was a design focused on this feeling of touching the screen. And we were so excited about this idea. But I'm going to tell you, it was really tough. <laughs> to move into a paradigm where suddenly, instead of all of this crazy UI that we had for the Sims PC experience, we had a very limited, very small UI that kids and parents could use to play with their Sims. I have to tell you, it was not intuitive to build, and it was certainly not intuitive for our playtesters. We had a lot, a lot of work to get this done right. Usually, you have so much information to communicate with a tool like this, and yet, if you communicate it in the wrong way or all at once, it totally overwhelms your players. And we really struggled with this on the project. 
What I learned working on this is that you have to think about your intuitions and question them. What seems compelling to someone in their 20s or intuitive to someone who's played games their whole lives might not necessarily read to a child of seven or eight or someone who's never held a controller without experiencing serious forms of dread. You really, really need to iterate and constantly test the assumptions that you have about your player. I find design to be totally humbling <laughs> because in doing design of any type, but game design especially, you realize just how much you think you know about other people's perceptions. And I believe with time and practice through game design, you can develop an ability to truly see through someone else's eyes, to see both sides of a design, to see both sides of a problem. If you can get that ability, you can see things that people see when they're not really there. If you have this ability to question yourself in your toolbox, you can know when something's really not going right, or better yet, you can see when it's going great. When your players are giving you so much that you don't really need to add any more. And that is something that has stuck with me forever. It will never go away. This is what kids see when they play with Legos. This is why Legos are awesome. I decided to take a trip down to LA with all my UI experience from my Sims and go to work on a new game that had an additional goal beyond just tools, which was experimentation, experimental play. Specifically, I went down to work with Steven Spielberg on the Boombox series. Um, he was the designer of the game and I arrived to the game a few months into production, I was totally amazed by his dedication with checking in on the team, making time for us, having us in his schedule when his schedule was seriously totally booked. Um, a truly amazing person to even be in the presence of. The core principle of this game design was experimentation. It was that people should feel comfortable playing to fail. We wanted them to experience the thrill of knocking down a huge stack of blocks that were gonna blow up and just fly everywhere with ever, without ever thinking about cleaning them up or whether, they not, whether or not they got a perfect score. We didn't want them to feel that dread of failure. We wanted them to feel the excitement of making a big mess. And more importantly, we really wanted families to relax and spend time together while the blocks shimmied and shook and then toppled over. We wanted them to absorb subconsciously, but very importantly, these concepts about how physics actually works. Havoc is the underlying physics system for this game and the game is totally based on simulation. We wanted them to fail fast while having fun. And we did everything we could to make it super glittery and super chunky and shiny and explosive and silly so that they wouldn't take themselves too seriously, so that they would be like, yeah, I'm just gonna let it rip. I'm gonna throw this ball at the screen and watch these blocks fly. Unfortunately, what we found was that for kids, this was probably not a problem, but for their parents, the fear of failure was pretty strong. I could put two adults in a room playing the same exact game as two kids, the kids would get through 10 times as much content. When your player is doing this, moving the camera, looking at the person next to them on the couch, you know you're not succeeding. That's not a video game, that's a test. <laughs> And getting them to build and experiment with this amazing tool set that we built, my husband and I worked on this tool together. We were so excited about it, and yet the parents were like, whoa, 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 you, you know, let's just go back to the main game. And the kids really wanted to put the little creatures down and throw balls at them and make everything explode. Parents, no way. Working on this game, 
after all the experiences I have with collaboration and all the experiences I had with questioning my assumptions, taught me something incredibly important. Once you have those two things in your design toolbox, you have to be able to focus your effort on the weakest part of the problem. You need to be able to knock that block out so everything else falls over. It's just like solving a puzzle in boom blocks. You need to focus on the things that are the most important to the players you want to reach. So what was our problem on boom blocks? For the longest time, we needed to lower the barrier of entry to parents while expanding the creativity of the editor so that kids would have time to play with it in their spare time. Because there was going to be family time when they were encouraging their parents to have a good time. And then there was going to be play time where they were actually building stuff and playing with it. And on the second version of this game, we actually got to build an editor that was live and online. And kids built puzzles and shared them with each other. And it was totally amazing. That's the one thing I learned. And the other thing I learned, strictly through osmosis, <laughs> was that you need to be a force multiplier. Not only do you need to focus on the exact right point in a design and really nail that one problem, you need to do it with the help of everyone at your disposal. Spielberg has an uncanny ability to ask the right question. He does not tell you the answer. The answer comes from you. Watching. The Boomblocks Bash Party team, which was like 12 internal developers and about seven contractors, knock out Bash Party in nine months for half the cost of the original game with this kind of leadership taught me that you can do anything with a leader who is a force multiplier, who lets you make the right decisions when you need to make them, who encourages you to put your mind on the problem and trusts you to run with it totally worth that lesson, 100%. And I carried this lesson forward with me to my next project, which is the last game we're going to talk about today, Journey. Journey is a game where you travel from a sandy desert to the peak of a distant mountain. How many of you had a chance to play it? Show of hands. All right, awesome. There's no spoilers in this. <laughs> At the center of our design for this game was the hope that players who met each other online could experience a genuine human connection with each other. In much the same way as when you're hiking in the wilderness, you might stop to take in a view or introduce yourself or just even smile at a passing stranger. Whereas if you saw them on a crowded train, you would just look right through them. To do this, we decided to eliminate all voice chat, all text chat, even the names that would identify our players to each other, so that they could experience each other truly as equals in a barren landscape. But creating a genuine human connection between players, especially people experienced with online games, was a lot more challenging than we bargained for. Especially early on in our tests, it seemed like everyone was naturally predisposed <laughs> to compete over resources, to race each other to points of interest, to be the leader, to run ahead. And it was tough. I mean, we really had to break through that behavior, and we didn't really know how to start. So we just began to prototype and implement different kinds of co-op gameplay. We built puzzles where players had to stand on separate switches. We built puzzles where they had to let down ladders for each other. We built puzzles that they had to push things over pits to make bridges for each other. And it just felt wrong. Over time, what we realized as a team, and this is a collective conversation, was that we were just band-aiding the problem. We needed to trust the players in our game and believe that they would see each other for who they really were. We needed to stop trying to force them to spend time together and encourage it. And when time spent alone in Journey felt truly lonely, and time spent together felt romantic and graceful and meaningful, people gravitated to one another. It took like two years.
<laughs> when two people are near each other in journey, they glow. They are made of cloth, and when cloth touches cloth, it harmonizes, and they become lighter, and they can pass through the air a little bit. Not forever. If you call out, you can extend that a little bit, and if you work really hard together, it's a little bit of like an aerobic workout, you can actually kind of jump through the air and get to really great heights. It encourages people to be near each other, but it does not demand it. You can play the entire game alone, or you can adventure together. And so far, the feedback has been totally stunning. writing this talk, I started looking back at my slides, which is what I do after I've been up all night working on them, thinking like, what is the point? Um, and I asked myself, was it really all a series of happy accidents? Has my path through game design or these tools that I've acquired, are they just luck? Or was there a thread there? And this is what I came up with. For every design goal that I've had to tackle, for every team that I've worked with. There has been a concrete and valuable practice that supports that goal. What's more, I really believe that these practices have scaffolded each other and that they build on one another over time. So here's the first one we talked about, explorational play in a game based on systems, which requires intense collaboration between all disciplines. We have the tools based game, which supports expressive play. And the design practice that it requires is rigorous testing, rigorous questioning, rigorous empathy with your player. We have the learning game, which is experimental in nature, where we want players to fail but to feel good while they're doing it, because that's how you learn. And that required incredible focus, solving the right problems, not every problem, because in order to fail, people have to have problems. 
And there was the feeling goal, an experiential game that gave you a new feeling towards another person, which required trust. When I look at these practices through the larger lens of my life, and I step outside of myself, I see them as life practices themselves. Collaborating with people is about working with your peers. It's about understanding them and valuing them for their individual, quirky, nerdy, amazing, talented, temperamental selves. Testing, questioning your assumptions, involves really understanding and thinking about what you think you know and being okay with being wrong. Focusing on the right problem, attacking the right thing, and not getting distracted means that you can be a force multiplier. It gives you the ability to really leverage the people that work with you so that you're not solving every problem. Because if you try to do that, you'll just wear yourself out. And trusting people that you work with and trusting your players means that you really have the ability to believe in others. It's not a common problem these days <laughs> for people to have an overdose of belief in others. What does that mean to you? Games are a rich, flexible, vibrant, artistic medium. The games I showed you, the games upstairs, they give us the ability to explore, to experiment, to express ourselves, and to experience each other in new ways that improve our quality of life and our experience of life. And I truly believe that game design is good for you. I believe that with every game designer's toolbox that we build on this planet, we are building valuable practices that can be cultivated by everyone. Luckily for you, now is the best time to make games in the history of our medium. There are better tools, there are more communities for design, entire school programs that will teach you how to become a game designer, how to become a game artist, how to be a game programmer, a writer, a producer, a sound designer. If you are inspired by the games that you saw here today, I want you to join us. You are the designers of the future. You design the future. Don't wait for someone else to tell you what it is. Thank you. I believe in questions, so now I would encourage you to ask me them. Microphones in either aisle. <laughs> ah, why is that a control? I just want to look at Journey a little more. <laughs> I've, been, I've been on the tour for three weeks, so I miss it. We'll start on this side. Um, thank you. It's on? You're welcome. Yes, it is. I was a big fan of both Flower and Journey. And uh, as I was playing both of them, I think I realized that I was sort of going along two parallel emotional tracks, one of which was sort of based on the uh, procedural elements of the game. So in Flower, it was sort of the simple joy of this beautiful landscape and you know, getting a bunch of flowers in one uh, swoop and things like that. And Journey was about you know, the experience of uh, going on this journey with another person and sort of that human connection. But there was also like a, an emotional track that seemed more architected. Mm -hmm. It was based on the events of the game where the, the feedback of the game would become more rich and positive just at, at certain points. Uh, it was sort of imposed from externally from the designers top down. Um, 
I was wondering, was this something intentional? Were you aware of this in the design process? Do you favor one path over another? Do you think they work against each other or in concert? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I would say, yes, we were totally aware of this. Um, and it was fundamental to the design philosophy um, at TGC, and specifically, I think, to Genova's approach to creative direction, that we need to sculpt something for you. There needs to be a form. There needs to be a narrative. There needs to be something for your experience to hang on. And he's incredible at creating that shape and then guiding us along that shape so that as we get to the places where we need to make decisions about the design, we can take that into account as we move forward. The camera, the lighting, the, the design of every object in Journey, it's all been gone over and over and over with a fine tooth comb. I can guarantee you there is nothing in the game that we have not thought about a lot. Um, does it work against itself? Um, it depends on the beliefs and the experiences of the person and the artifact. I have seen it work well, and I have seen it work less well. I have had people tell me after playing Journey, why did I have to follow that guy the whole time? You don't. I mean, it's a mirror, dude. You know? <laughs> if that's what you see, that's what you see. And for that person, being told a narrative on top of being irritated that they gotta follow this dude around, like, that's not gonna be successful but I'm not really sure that that's our fault. Thank you. Other side. Hi, uh, it was a very inspiring talk, thank you. Oh, you're welcome, thank you for coming. Um, I, uh, I, I was at uh, Hideo Kojima's uh, um, discussion as well, and he mentioned uh, how video games are a collaborative art. Well, uh, I myself, I'm a writer, and uh, I've actually been uh, trying to do uh, uh, collaborative uh, projects with people. First, it was uh, a, uh, a comic book script that I wrote, but then uh, the person who was going to do the <laughs> art flaked out and... You know. Yeah, we've all been there. So you've had a, you've had a hard time meeting collaborators, or do you feel that it's just difficult to collaborate? Well, I've just no. Uh, it just feels like there are very few team players. Hmm. I think that would be a fair statement of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or maybe it's just that the team players aren't on television, and the team players aren't the ones that we watch in shows or read about in newspapers. I mean, maybe it's that there are a lot of team players, but we're just being really quiet. Hmm. I don't know. So um, how do you, uh, I mean, besides, you know, just plain old perseverance, how do you get through that kind of roadblock? <sighs> Sometimes you can't. Sometimes uh, when you're trying to collaborate with someone and they're really bitten into something and they won't let it go, there's just no way around it and you have to let them simmer down. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to establish a creative connection with someone, even though you really like them as a person and you feel connected to them and you seem to have the same ideas, it just never gels. Mm -hmm. It's like a bad relationship. You know, you go on a few dates and you have great conversation, but you just never feel the chemistry. It's very personal. Um, the way you get through it is just to just keep trying. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Hi, I was wondering, um, in game design, what would you say is the best way to actually get a project started? To start it. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean to sound like Yoda there, but I mean, I think that that really is the answer. If you want to do something, you should just do it, and don't be afraid of screwing up. The, the number one thing that keeps us back is being afraid of failure. That's what happened with boom blocks. Parents would be embarrassed when they couldn't solve a dorky physics puzzle with their kids. They would feel stupid, like they were a bad parent because they didn't know which of the four blocks to hit first. And the kids still love them, that's just totally in their head. When you feel like you can't start a project, it's because you're afraid that if you start it, you won't know how to finish it. And so what? You can always start something new. Yeah, I've had a passion for video games my whole life, but never realized that's what I want to do for a living. 
uh, until about like a year and a half ago, and, or actually more like two and a half years How old ago. are you now? I'm 28. Oh man, you got years on me. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. But uh, um, basically, I, you know, I've already had a BS in communications, and then just two and a half years ago, I was like, how do I crack into this industry? And so I'm starting um, like two years into gaming simulation design online. Great. Um, but do you have any tips on, like I've sent so many resumes yeah. uh, just trying to crack into this industry yeah. so the best, hard. Honestly, the best way to get into the games industry is to volunteer at your local IGDA chapter and volunteer as a CA at GDC. If you go to GDC and you spend time, there's gonna be 12, 14,000, 15,000 developers in that room. They're, 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 just, they're just moving through and somebody needs help. You know, if you're a CA, guaranteed you in two years, you're gonna meet somebody that's got a, a little crack that you can stick your foot in. Through test, doing, you know, uh, translations. You might have to move someplace you weren't thinking about moving, you know, like the middle of the country or somewhere in Asia or wherever, you know. <laughs> you don't know where you're gonna be, but you won't care because you'll be doing your dream. So yeah, my number one piece of advice to students, and especially people that are getting a little bit of a late start, is to put the elbow grease in and find something you're passionate about and volunteer. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering, uh, since I'm just about to go to college and I've had a passion for video game design all my life, um, to, is pursuing a degree in video game design uh, worth it when trying to get into the video game, uh, video game industry? Because I've already been accepted to some schools which have that uh, program. But I've heard uh, other people say that it's better to pursue a computer science degree before going to the industry. Mm, do you like to program? Um, I don't mind it. You don't mind it? <laughs> uh, I'm going to be doing it a okay. lot. Um, well, so, so uh, what do you do in your spare time when you're not doing anything related to video games? Uh, drawing, writing. Yeah, probably not computer science for you. I'm not saying it's not good to learn how to program. You should definitely take some programming oh, no, classes, no, no. but don't major in it. Do what okay. you're passionate about. Do okay. what you do in your spare time. You'll be happier. Okay, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the PlayStation 3 controller has 14 buttons. Indeed it does. You use two of them for that. <laughs> only, only two. Yeah. And despite and having such limited modes of, well, yeah, and, and analog, but... If you want two, to. Two face buttons. Yeah. Uh, so despite having only two actions, you managed to get much more effective um, player communication out of that than you'd typically get on, say, uh, Xbox Live or Team Chat or something like well, that, I'd you. say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't say I don't usually uh, hang out in those places. <laughs> Find them a so bit do, intimidating. Do you think that that sort of simplicity is always a goal in game design mm. or or is it more appropriate per on a per game basis yeah no you have to do what's right for your design you know dark souls wouldn't feel good if it didn't if it only had two buttons <laughs> it would be like super frustrating skyrim i mean you know they need more buttons because you need to be able to get into your inventory and sort it and like <laughs> And they also need to be able to, like, you can be able to change the background against the inventory because it's such a pain to read it after 25 hours of playing for, you know, without food. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's completely and totally specific to the game that you're making. And I, have, I mean, I've worked on games for, for, you know, kids ages three and up and Journey, you know, I mean, a three-year-old probably not going to get it. But, you know, it's playable by them. I, you know, it just depends on, it depends on what you're trying to do, you know. And if... Uh, if we tried to tell everybody the TGC way is the way, or the Robin Hunnicky design toolbox is the essential toolbox, or one of these other ridiculous statements, then we would be telling you what games you were going to make, and no one can do that. Thanks. Especially not a marketing manager. <laughs> uh, yours, you guys. Given the many different interests and passions you've accrued throughout your life, and assuming that trend continues... Oh, yes. What Unfortunately do you want... for my bookshelves. <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> That's a really, really good question. Um, I've thought about hairdressing um, because I love hair um, and I love like going to the hair salon and talking to the hairdresser. Um, it's like therapy, but then you look good <laughs> instead of just like sobbing and feeling bad. Um, no, I, I, I think probably uh, the most likely outcome is um, a really good, accomplished parent 
and a teacher. I think in the long run, I would love to grow up into someone who could teach something valuable to my children and to someone else's kids. Um, but that's like, it just feels like such a responsibility. I really do still feel like I'm 15. I, I, I'm amazed that I'm almost 40. It's insane to me. Like, I really do not feel it. And um, at some, some point, my body will catch up to me and tell me that it's time. But right now, um, yeah, that would probably be my, my ultimate goal, would be to be valuable in a, in a context like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Howdy. Um, first of all, thank you very much for You're speaking. Uh, You're welcome. Really find what you say inspirational, especially about it never being too late. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And uh, what I wanted to ask was when you say you pursue your, pa your passion, I'm very passionate about just talking. Like, I love communicating with other people. Great. How detrimental is that in your field? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I think Kelly's gonna answer this one for me. <laughs> I am such a chatterbox and I never shut up in meetings and people always have me tell me like, okay, we got it, fine, stop with the feedback. It's totally obvious that you don't like this music or whatever. Um, it's only as detrimental as you let it be. Um, over the years, my ears have grown a little and my mouth has shrunk a little. Um, maybe by the time I get to my aspirational goal of being a teacher, it will have shrunk even more. Um, the thing that's detrimental is talking over people. I talk along, like, you know, even when you guys are telling me these questions, I'm like, great for you, awesome, way to go. Like, it just comes out of me. I don't know where it comes from. My grandmother was like this, and like, that's just how I am. Marion, it's all your fault. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know how else to be, but, um, but people will appreciate you for who you are because you're awesome. Like each one of us has something to deliver that's really amazing. And if we spend our time thinking, well, I'm not Angelina Jolie or I'm not Cliffy B, then we're just sad. I'm, I'll never be you, Cliffy B. <laughs> Thank you Guns and roses, man. All right, see you. Thank you for being here today. Thank with you. Us. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I am aspiring to be a game designer just like you, but I promise we won't be butting heads <laughs> for the same position. You want to take all my great ideas. <laughs> I promise I won't. Okay. Um, I've noticed in many games over the past, I don't know, maybe five years, maybe longer, that all games have adopted a system of gaining content in-game mm -hmm. by either upgrade or gaining experience to upgrade your character's level to do this and that, or getting a vendor system where you get in-game currency and do this. I really have grown to hate it, to be honest. I don't like it one bit. And I just wanted to ask you, how do you think it's very necessary? Do you think it's very effective? I mean, it depends on your goals. You know, if you want to hook people, like I, I have a friend that designed a game that I was totally addicted to for like two days. Mm -hmm. And it was addictive because it had no undos. Yeah. You had to work really hard to not screw up. And mm -hmm. if you did screw up, you could save a little points and you could buy an undo. And then eventually you ran out of points for undos and you had to spend money on undos. It was really good. It was like, <laughs> It's a packing problem, so I was just, I, I love packing problems, I love organizing stuff, you know. When I'm not doing design, I'm doing production. And I just had to delete it from my phone. I literally spent four hours playing it on a Saturday, and I was like, I need to do gardening and like my laundry, and here I am. Like, it's worse than The Sims. It was just totally addictive, I couldn't put it down. Um, it was very effective at generating what they wanted. Um, would I design that game? Probably not, because it's not my goal. Yeah. Um, if I spent all of my life hating on all of the bad music and bad food and bad movies and bad clothes and bad hairdos that exist, yeah. instead of focusing on the good ones, I would be a miserable person. And I tell game designers that all the time. If you don't like it, don't play it. Other people get a, get a kick out of it, that's good for them. It, they're not your audience. So yeah, yeah it's, it's okay and it'll probably trend down eventually, maybe. Yeah. Unless they get really rich, in which case we're all doomed. I, you know. I, <laughs> Don't stress it. Just do what you want to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kelly. Um, you're such an icon in our business. Mm -hmm. um, you're certainly an inspiration to me, who I am a tad bit older to you, than you and came to this later than you did, but I am an aspiring game designer and currently teaching at University of Baltimore in simulation and digital entertainment. Fantastic. 
And um, every, every semester I see in my classrooms that we have 20 great guys in there, and they are there, and they're wonderful, and there's two women. Great women. Two great women, courageous women, courageous women who are, who are going where no one has gone before, almost. Um, how, how can we get, how can we inspire our girls to say, this party is great. <laughs> Come and play. It's fun in here. Make it great. I mean, make it not be that you have signaling threat when you go into an environment where you're outnumbered. I mean, it's almost biological at this point. This is a question of gender studies, feminism, science education, just oppression. Um, uh, if you're different and you are surrounded by people that are different from you, you feel bad. It's an actual biological fact. And in order to get over it, you need to create environments that are welcoming and supportive to those people. Um, Google does a great job of it. My husband's an African-American. He's been working there for almost two years now, loves it. They have affinity groups. They have meetings. If you go to Google slash diversity, you can see every color of the rainbow, every place all over the world where Googlers live and where they work and where, they're, where they shine. Um, we could do a much better job of that in the games industry, in computer science, and technology, and we should be doing it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. My name is Ben. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, I'm interested in designing games to help people work their way through psychological dysfunctions mm. or behavioral just issues that they have. That's an awesome idea. And um, some of the ones, uh, I think your games are good examples because they really just evoke this emotional response. And uh, another game, as example, would be Elude, which I believe is focused on depression. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask, what types of dysfunctional behavior traits would you focus on mm. as an initial cut on this? You know, it's interesting. I did like Elude, and I've seen other games that sort of try to talk about depression or, or mood swings. Um, I think domestic violence, there's a lot of education that can be done about that. Um, poverty, um, uh, particularly um, childhood uh, malnutrition. There are a lot of things about, you know, uh, sort of social issues related to those things that people don't really perceive. Kids that act up in schools and so forth, just hungry. Um, but there is an entire Games for Change initiative um, and Games for Learning, and both of those, both of those uh, communities have a lot of people interested in this. So I would highly encourage you to reach out to them. Ben Sawyer and um, and his colleagues have done a lot in the space. Um, the hardest thing to do uh, when you're dealing with a, a, a difficult subject is to do it with dignity. And, you know, as we just heard from the gentleman before you, you know, sometimes, you know, you're not going to want to have microtransactions in a game about depression. <laughs> you know, that's going to be, that's going to be pretty not cool. So um, I think, I think the most important thing is to just pick something that resonates with you. I've actually been um, thinking a lot lately about my grandmother, Marion, and just her, um, as she ages, you know, her memories fade. And, you know, I, I know there's something in me about that. And I don't know what it is yet, but eventually it'll emerge. And it'll, it'll be, I don't know, will it be fun? I don't know, it might be contemplative. But that's what resonates with me. So pick the thing that resonates with you, I would say. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. And there's a game called Spent that actually talks about poverty. I oh, that's cool. I haven't not. seen that one. I should Google it. It's just at playspent.org. I will. Free. Thank you. Yeah. Um, narratively, two different types of games have really arisen over the past 10 or so years, and that is games that tell you a story and games that make the player tell the story. Mm -hmm. Games like, like uh, Tell the Story would be like Final Fantasy, a very linear track, whereas games like Flower or Minecraft really let the player create their own experience. So my question is, which one do you think is more important to focus on, the narrative of the actual story and the game, or the narrative that the player can create on their own? Mm. Well, for Journey, it was definitely a combination of both. Um, having both there, like I said earlier, gave us the ability to have that structure so that when we needed, when we needed to know where a player was going to be emotionally, we had some guideposts. Um, but that's just because we wanted them to have an emotional curve that was kind of specific. 
if you want to make a game like Minecraft where you can just kind of express yourself and like build these beautiful cathedrals and like have these community um, environments where people build together almost like a special bat cave, you know, like that's, that's really cool too. Um, I don't think one is more important than the other. Um, I personally have always been a huge advocate of putting the player on stage, um, of getting away from them as a game designer, of not trying to beat them over the head with a narrative or a meaning. Um, was very passionate about that on Journey, making sure that we left it open so that people could interpret it the way they wanted to and see in it the things that they needed to see. You know, when you go on a hike, the hike doesn't change. You change. And like one time you're walking and you're like, you know, my grandmother just passed away and it feels really sad. And then the next time you're walking and you just got a promotion and everything is flowers and rainbows. And like, it's not a different place. It's the same mountain or the same beach coastline that it's always been, you're different. And you know, that was important for this game. But not every game has to be that way. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, I think I'm just saying the same thing over and over again, do what you want. <laughs> it's like a broken record. I read a, I read a lot of articles and stuff about the about the company and about Journey and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Journey marks the end of your three game contract with Sony. So really, uh, what's next for <laughs> that game company and you as a designer? What's next is I'm gonna go home and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> We're just, we're just thrilled that Journey is getting the reception that it's getting. Um, Kelly and I were able to download the game at a friend's house uh, uh, in, uh, in Austin at South by Southwest and play with just like normal everyday people. And you know, at the party people were like, aren't you sick of your own game? Like actually, not really, not yet. I'm doing totally great. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, we're just taking a break. I think we got time for maybe one more question. So um, I know that in your uh, presentation, you talked about how important collaboration is. Um, but having been part of some myself, I know that egos and ideas sometimes can be very powerful driving factors. And they can overshadow the collective vision. So what would be your advice when that does happen? Take a breather. Get some sleep. Go for a walk, do your gardening, hang out with your girlfriend, or your boyfriend, or your best friend, whatever you do, and just let go. I mean, most of the time, stuff that we really fought about, when I look back at my entire design career, stuff that I got really, really, like, just like beef, I was just really mad about it, <coughs> meaningless to the player. So insignificant in the scheme of the experience we were offering, just personally important to me because I'm a little bit tweaky about things, or personally important to somebody else because they they designed it and they didn't want it cut. You know, you got to let go sometimes. And if you're always seeing that it's the other person that's the problem, then it's really not the other people that are the problem. <laughs> sometimes, if you turn the other cheek and you just let it go, you realize actually, yeah, I was just kind of holding on to that for too long. So, just take a break. We don't take enough breaks in this industry. We need to do more of it. Thank you guys so much for coming out. <laughs>